Okay, first of all, that is not Missouri. You can fool the outsiders, James, but you can't fool me. I grew up about four hours from where you did, and at pretty much the same time. I know my Missourian landscapes, and that is not one of them. Too green, too lush. Those are the rich, verdant fields of a place that was underwater 65 million years ago. Like Georgia, where all these Marvel movies are made now. Because Georgia politicians love to talk about evil Hollywood liberals corrupting their children and interfering in their elections with the one hand, and hand out tax breaks to every major film corporation with the other. Turns out, evil Hollywood liberal money spins as well as everyone else, and money is the only thing my little blue orb actually worships. Is it any wonder I want to get my ass into space? Shit. It's been too long anyway. On our last episode of Guardians of the Galaxy, a space pirate, two bounty hunters, a dictator's adopted daughter, as he would put it, and a man out to avenge his family's death, united to defeat a would-be world destroyer with the power of friendship, and a little help from a crystallization of one of the fundamental forces of the universe. Having made a name for themselves, well, stolen it from a sarcastic quip that would-be world destroyer meant as a sick burn, which I still really like, we catch up to our guardians doing odd jobs for the galaxy's ruling class. And immediately fucking it up, thanks to their own big mouths and Rocket the Raccoon's incurable technological kleptomania. With that nice new ship they got off Xandar in pieces, and the team incessantly bickering, as is their wont, it's the perfect time for Peter Starlord Quill's biological father to finally show up with an offer Peter can't refuse. The problem with super teams, as some of you may have noticed by now, is that they can get real unwieldy real fast. Thankfully, comic book writers, my favorite being Justice League writer Gardner Fox, figured out a way around this decades ago. Split them all into smaller teams as soon and as often as possible. So while Star-Lord, Gamora, and Drax go off with Peter's bio-dad, Rocket and Groot are left on repair duty leaving them grounded and vulnerable to any pack of a-holes that might want the Guardians' heads. Like the band of Ravagers Star-Lord grew up with, and then screwed over at the end of the last movie. Led by his actual dad, Yondu. Now, maybe it's just me, but I'm detecting a real bad parent theme running through this phase of the Marvel Universe. Ultron of course, had the two worst dads you can have if you restricted your choices to the original Avengers. One could, and I pretty much did, boil Ant-Man down to a battle between the two surrogate sons of Hank Pym, while his daughter is literally, like, right over there. Like, Ah, whatever. Save it for the sequel, I guess. The Civil War was, if not outright caused, then certainly exacerbated by Tony Stark's sudden need to wreck his hate upon the man who killed his parental units. Homecoming, as we've discussed, was a Spider-Man movie, and young Mr. Parker can't seem to help but recruit surrogate bad dads. Four of them, in six movies. And counting. We'll talk about Ragnarok and Black Panther later, but should be fairly obvious how they fit into the theme if you've seen them. Here, Ego, because that's his name, shows up to give Quill a taste of real power after a lifetime spent scavenging the ruins of planets that could pass for Dark Souls levels. He immediately falls for it because dear old dad sings him a happy song about being a small G god and wanting to seek out new life and new civilizations. And because Quill doesn't recognize the name Ego, who is very much not his dad in the comics. Though, you could always be watching this in the future, after the power of retcons have, you know, made that the case. And if so, prepare for some ancient history. Here's how a friend explained it to me. If you crammed Ego 
and Star-Lord's actual comic book father into one of those teleporters from the fly, Kurt Russell's character from this movie would walk out. He's more personable than any ego I've ever met. And Jason of Spartax never tried any plan as grandiose as take over every habitable planet in the Milky Way at once by replacing all of its locally grown life with, well, himself. Yondu may have been a pirate, mercenary, bank robber, and gods know what else, but at least he didn't have a god complex. That's more Thanos' line. And I do appreciate how Gamora, whom Thanos would call his daughter, and whom the rest of us would just call his kidnap victim, is both the one who convinces Peter to hear Ego out in the first place, and the first to suspect Ego of something other than a sudden attack of paternalism. Conscious of her own dead parents, Gamora sees a chance for Peter to relate to his parent as an adult, something she will never be able to do herself, unfortunately. But once they're on planet Ego, and he's served them up a whole bunch of empty utopian platitudes, Gamora can't stop herself from smelling bullshit. Never forget that smell if you've lived with it your whole fucking life. Though I must admit, on first viewing, a year before Infinity War came out, and we got at least some grasp of Thanos' ideology, I took Gamora's flip-flopping on this issue as an easy way to create drama and sunder the team even further. So, as ever, your mileage may vary depending on how many comic books you've read. There are probably also legal reasons for combining two villains into one. Even though Ego, the Living Planet, debuted in a Thor comic, his early adventures are all very much tied up with Galactus a Fantastic Four villain, and thus part of the grand movie rights deal 20th Century Fox made way back when that's caused nothing but sorrow and horror for us all. I mean, sure, Disney's trying to buy out Fox's entertainment division now, but they probably weren't even thinking about that three years ago when this sucker started pre-production. And God knows how long they're going to haggle over the $51 billion price tag. Oh, it's 52 billion now, is it? Great. My favorite fucking number. Crucified space Jesus, Jeff. You keep haunting me even when I'm talking about your competition. <laughs> As ever, in this painfully literal age of ours, the clue is in the name, and Ego's name is Ego an ancient and self-important entity who identifies as what's called a celestial, making my inner Wikipedia editor immediately pipe up and ask, uh, called by whom? Where? When? It's the first we've heard about him on film, so... Though we comic book fans know them as an absurdly powerful, absurdly ancient race of beings who are ultimately responsible for pretty much everything in the Marvel multiverse, including its very existence. Artist, writer, legend Jack Kirby created them all in the middle 70s, during what I call the Paradise Lost phase of his career, a decade after he created the original Ego. Movie Ego here claims not to remember anything before he found himself conscious floating in space. And who knows? He could be lying, or selectively editing the truth like he does in front of his son's new surrogate family. All I know for sure is that James Gunn et al. made him a celestial with absolutely no outcry from the peanut gallery. Cementing a theory I've been working on for quite some time, that my fellow comic book fans only care about canon, or faithfulness to source material, when they think it can win them a dumb argument on the internet. I mean, look at me. And what I'm doing. Like, right now. I was hard on Guardians of the Galaxy 1 because nobody really wanted to be at the time, and I found that funny. But I guess James Gunn's just too damn famous to take constructive criticism from his fellow Missourians. Nah, I'm just kidding. He's too damn busy is what he is. Welcome, my son. Welcome to the machine.
even if he actually read all of the reviews that Rotten Tomatoes uses to trick advertisers into thinking they actually do something, he probably didn't have time to take any of them to heart. Pre-production on this thing started while the last one was still in theaters, and in consequence, everything I said about the last one still applies. Only more so. Star-Lord's still a self-centered douche who doesn't even blink when his dad starts going on about leading the cosmos to where it needs to be, quote-unquote. After giving a capsule review of the 1972 song Brandy that would have made Patrick Bateman murderously envious. Though nothing is going to beat those faces the Maximovs pulled when Ultron started going off about the human race will be given every opportunity to evolve. Gamora is still the only adult on the ship, but she goes from zero to reconciliation with her evil sister in all of one scene. Drax, with his revenge pretty much complete, even though he kind of transferred it to Thanos last time, is left more or less a one-joke character. And that one joke is, hey, insulting people to their faces is comedy, right? And everyone who knows and or loves any previous incarnation of Mantis answered with one resounding voice, no. And by the way, fuck you. Mantis deserved better. They said, and I can't really argue with them. I mean... Rocket and Groot remain the most interesting double act of them all, and should totally get their own show. Though even if they do, there's a high probability that'll follow the tell-don't-show method of storytelling as well. In that spirit, everybody's still monologuing. Damn it. I expect Ego to pull that shit, but Nebula? Yondu? Here's a little movie critic quick tip for you. If a kind of, sort of, mostly antagonist from the first film starts going off about their tragic backstory in the sequel, then there's a high chance they're probably either going to die, uh, pull a face turn, or pull a face turn and then die. Spoiler alert, but seriously. Name an actor in their 60s who's actually survived a Marvel movie and who isn't Samuel L. Jackson. Or Michael Douglas. Ah, shit. Did I just spoil Ant-Man and the Wasp for myself? Fuck. Oh, wait. Glenn Close. Glenn Close lived. And where there's Glenn Close, there is hope. Assuming she didn't die off-screen before Infinity War started. And something tells me she did. And that nice middle-class cop family from Guardians 1 that was supposed to contrast with the fucked up outlaw family that the Guardians are, yeah, they're probably dead too. Still, the last film seeded the idea that Yondu was protecting Quill from his true heritage this whole time by raising him up in that space pirate life. And it's nice to see that pay off immediately. Especially since it's in a form I was not expecting. Yondu who clawed his way out of slave pits and into a life that certainly looks like rollicking adventure, even to the most cynical of Midwesterners, is and always was Peter Quill's real father. Yondu it was, and no other, who taught Quill the skills he'd need to save the galaxy, twice over now. In this film alone, we see Quill pilot a spaceship through an asteroid field, in the middle of a running firefight, Crash land, said spaceship, without killing anyone. Any landing you can walk away from, am I right? And hotwire yet another spaceship on the fly. I speak from experience when I say these are not skills you can learn in Missouri. Plus, all his life, Yondu provided an example of what a captain should be. An example Quill is, even if only subconsciously, trying to emulate, now that he's got his own ship and his own crew, and they're going off on their own kick-ass adventures. Quill still has some growing up to do, obviously. But by all the gods, Joseph Campbell called it the kill your fathers portion of the hero's journey. And surprise, a Guardians of the Galaxy movie took that literally as well. As if the spirit of Drax lives on in us all. 
As before, everything happens too fast, and nobody has much room to breathe. Hence the monologuing. Rare is the two-hour, fifteen-minute movie that feels like it's on fast-forward, even at normal speed. But, here we are. These Marvel team-up movies have a problem. Several, really. But the big one is the fact that they all structure their climaxes around their titular teams finally ceasing their yammering and working together. You think you're sick of origin stories, but really you're not. You're sick of this. Sick of whole films leading up to that one glory shot of the team, finally and fully assembled, with the camera doing a 360 degree pan around them. Like some other Marvel movie I could name. The spirit of 2012 certainly lives on. It is with us always. Can't you feel its breath on your neck? Not that I'm immune or anything. <laughs> Shit. Never thought I'd see a $250 million Jack Kirby flavored space opera with a soundtrack made out of my parents' record collection circa 1990. Never mind two of them. Written and directed by a Missourian who moved to the coast to try and break it in the entertainment industry. God damn. Solidarity, bro. You give hope to us all. Might as well walk around with an S on your chest. I just wish Marvel would hire some better writers. People who know how to weave exposition and character development and jokes and all the other things you need to make a story together into a, let's say, slightly more seamless tapestry. Here's a thought. How about the movie side of Marvel start poaching some actual comic book writers? Hmm? Or what about all those cats who used to slave away in the animation department all those years when they were the only thing we had to work with? Oh, wait. What's that on the horizon? Why, I do believe it's the end of days. Ragnarok. Special thanks to Mr. Hootie Dean, Detective Steve, friend and colleague, and the After Movie Diner, colleague and friend. If you'd like some special thanks, then support this show by throwing me a dollar on the Patreon. Because I talk way too much shit to be advertiser friendly. If you liked this video, hit the like button, and the subscribe button, and all the little letter buttons on your keyboard down in the comments section below. Next time, I'm recording this on May the 4th, so take a wild guess.